Last week when Josh was preaching, I had the opportunity to be in a different part of the room in the building than I usually am, and I was very impressed upon watching our church care for one another all morning. I sat and watched Dan escort somebody in by the arm to make sure they didn't slip, and JR opened doors, and Lois served coffee, and just person after person, I could say name after name of people who came in with this alertedness toward helping one another. And some of them were on team serving, but it wasn't just the team. It was just the culture of our church, caring for each other, loving each other, looking out for one another. And I was so moved and just sat back and thought, this is such a great place to be around, such a great culture. As I became a pastor, I had hoped that I would be a part of a church where the body of Christ was all functioning and caring for one another, and it would never be centered around me or based on a, a person but Jesus could be the head and we could all function. And last week was just an exciting indication of seeing people operating and loving one another. If you're newer to Pathway or if you're kind of getting warmed up to that culture, I really do want you to know no matter how long you've been here, we love that you're here and we want to get to know you, help develop relationships um, as you're ready, connect you to a, a life group or a serve team. And if you would like to serve a little bit more intentionally, we probably have a team that matches what you care about. There are some openings in um, front door greeters, kids ministry, a variety of ways that are kind of easy, lo lower level, just kind of get your feet wet serving opportunities. So if you'd like to do that, please let us know. You can do that by a communication card or reaching out to us. We'd love to help you get connected. It's Valentine's Eve and Super Bowl Sunday, and what a great time to talk about the topic that we're talking about. We start a mini-series today called Let's Talk About Sex in Church, and if you'll notice on the graphic, it is rated PG. What does PG stand for? Yeah, that's actually the, the idea here, that as we talk about these things, if there are kids in the room or if you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, somewhere in your life or you're involved with kids, that this could help form some discussions around the table as well for this really important topic, which is being talked about almost everywhere else in society pretty often and with a lot of opinions. True? But often can seem like a subject of intense silence in the church. If there's any talk about sex, it's sort of like, just don't. You know, not a lot of conversation around the topic. So we're going to talk about this today and next week in depth. And I just want you to know, to put you at ease, it's, it is PG. You, you can relax. It's not, not going to be a, a graphic or, or uncomfortable, very um, intense thing. But we're going to look today at some biblical ideas and principles that shape how we view gender and sexuality and our, our own um, perspective on that. And then next week, we're going to talk more specifically about how do we apply some of these things in the real world with our own lives and our own brokenness and past and hurts and imperfections and relationships and just sort of the reality. So today is more of the, the biblical vision. And next week, we, we'll talk about a lot of real difficult and, and personal stuff as far as how this plays out. I want to read to you a verse from 2 Timothy 4. Paul is writing to a young preacher, and he's telling him to preach God's word. And then he says in verse 3, there is going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth, but they'll go around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. There's going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth, but they'll go around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. My goal for us this morning is not that we will hear whatever we want to hear. And there are probably a lot of varieties of what even we would want to hear, or not just to affirm what may be the message that you've heard before. My goal this morning is that we could hear the truth of God's word, however degree it cuts against our preference. When we talk about this topic, like many other topics, 
God has a, a purpose and an intention that he communicates to people about sexuality. And we have the opportunity to follow that or to just throw our hands up and say, forget that, I'm doing my own thing. But God's way is better. It works out better in the end. Time and time again, we've seen or I've been involved in conversations where people have said, I'm just going to do this my way. And then later the brokenness fallout happens. And then later I get to be walking with the piecing things back together because in the long run, God's way is always the way to walk that leads to life. I want to share a story from the Old Testament that kind of uh, sets the course for us. And it's a story that seems very unrelated to the topic that we're talking about. It's Elijah on Mount Carmel from 1 Kings 18. If you're familiar with this story, Elijah is a great prophet in the Old Testament. He speaks for God to the whole nation, even to the king and, and the queen. He speaks for God to the people. And the whole nation at this point had really lost their way. They were a nation that God established and that God wanted them to know him and, and worship him personally, but they had gotten some bad leadership and they began to influence the people to worship Baal. And Baal was a neighboring religion that just brought in a lot of other kinds of practices. So a lot of the nation at this point was worshiping Baal and had lost sight of God. And so God calls the nation to a decision point. He brings Elijah to a mountain and they have a contest of gods. Sort of this, this epic contest between God and Baal. So here's Elijah building this altar, sacrificing an animal, and here are these hundreds of priests of Baal who build their own sacrifice. And the deal was, the winner is the God who lights the sacrifice on fire from heaven. It's a pretty dramatic contest. So Elijah's representing God, and then he just raises the stakes by dumping all kinds of buckets of water on his sacrifice to make it even harder to light on fire. So Obviously, it's going to take some miraculous intervention for either one of these sacrifices to light. Baal team goes first. They begin to call out to their God. They start doing a pretty big show, cutting themselves and dancing around, trying to get Baal's attention to light the fire. After a while, nothing happens. Then Elijah prays, <laughs> fire consumes the altar, and there's this just whole wake-up moment revolution for the nation who's watching this to go, oh my goodness, we have lost our way. We've gotten so wrapped up in this worship of Baal, we forgot who our God is, and they had this defining fork in the road. So Elijah called the people back to worship God. Now that doesn't sound like it has a whole lot to do with the serious topic that we're talking about, but integrated into Baal worship was this idea of sense pleasure. Temple prostitution was actually part of the religion. And God called them back to a different way. Eugene Peterson wrote about the Baalism. He said, sensory participation is featured in Baalism. Sexual activity in the cult is frequent since it achieves the primary goal, the ecstatic plunge of the whole sensory person into the passion of the religious moment. Sacred prostitution is a common feature in Baalism. By contrast, worshiping God is defined by God's authoritative and clear word. Nothing is dependent on feelings or weather. All is determined by Scripture and Jesus. No one is left to do what he or she simply feels like doing. God has revealed who he is and demands obedience. In one cultural narrative, we hear this kind of thinking of, if this makes you feel good, if this brings your life enhancement, then how could it be wrong? There is this sense that we get what we pay for in terms of pleasure. We're willing to do things that make us feel good. And that even sometimes connects to our views with God. And God is 
the purpose of God, to, to make my life better in the ways that I want to. And this is a great distinction to say, actually following God is more about following God than God following me. In terms of sexuality, the real root question we have to ask ourselves is, which God am I following? If we can square that away at the beginning, the rest becomes a little bit more clear. His way is always the best and it leads to life. When you came in, you may have gotten a half sheet handout with today's notes with the series graphic on the top. If you didn't get one but you'd like one, we'll get one to you. Just raise your hand here for a minute. Okay. Or if you if you need to go back and grab one, there are some on the columns so that you can fill in the blanks. The, the notes will be on the front. And today I want to establish a few foundational ideas from scripture about what the body is and what sex is. Here's number one. My body is a part of who I am. My body is a part of who I am. It's not the only thing that I am, but it is a part of who I am. That sounds sort of a, like a duh statement. Of course, my body is part of who I am. But that's not obvious. There are different ways that people think about their bodies that are not uh, congruent with Scripture. For example, your body is not just the cage of your soul. It's not just the housing unit for your real self, your mind or your spirit, which is someday going to be shed and then you go live forever without your body. Your body is actually part of who you are. God created us with bodies on purpose. In our growing digital technological era, this is coming into all kinds of fun questions for people. Am I, am I more, more than my body or could I transcend my body? If I could download the data of my brain, the software, the, the data into another physical hardware unit, if the technology could let me like when my body dies, go into another body, would that still be me? If I go into a virtual reality space and I'm acting out through an avatar, is that, but it's my decisional influence, is that me or is there something integral about being incarnate in a body? And scripture says our body is actually part of who we are. It's not the only thing we are. We're more than just flesh and blood, but we're not less. We have spirit, we have mind, and bodies are an integral part of who we are. Pop quiz, will you have this body forever? No. In case you weren't aware, someday this is going to die. But, will you have a body forever? Distinctly, yes. So the vision of scripture is that we will live forever in a resurrected body like Jesus. He was the first model of what's going to happen for those who believe. We will be resurrected with bodies that are very similar but distinctly different than bodies that we have. In fact, read through scripture. Jesus lives and reigns at the right hand of God now in his resurrected body. Like You could measure his height and weight. He's a person incarnate. Our bodies are not tangential to who we are. They're a core part of who we are. Number two, which leads us to the second. Our bodies are vehicles through which we give and receive love. When God expresses his love to you, it comes through the channel of your body. Think of the ways that you've experienced God's love before. Maybe a kind word from someone else, a meal that somebody dropped off when you were sick, a, a pat on the back or a hug around the shoulder when you were down, a feeling in worship when God's love just sort of seemed to flood through your body, <clears throat> a word that he spoke to you through a book. All those things, your body is the vehicle through which God shows love and through which you love God. Try to imagine an act of worship that doesn't involve your body. 
There isn't one. And the big sacraments, baptism and communion, full embodied experiences, singing, giving, listening, reading, serving, all of these things are fully embodied experiences, which, by the way, side note, for those of you who work with your hands or have physical or somewhat manual jobs, whether you're building cabinets or polishing parts or programming with keys or crocheting something, there are implications for what you do with your body as an act of worship. Scripture tells us whatever your hands find to do, do it all for the glory of God. Work with whatever you have in front of you with your whole heart because you're working for the Lord, not just people. And sometimes we get this messed up in vision that there are spiritual things and spiritual work and then there's just every day have to get this done kind of manual work where we have to do this and do that and do the dishes and do the laundry and fix this thing. Whoa, there's no such thing. There's no such thing in God's perspective. All that we do with our bodies can be done to God. Listen to Romans 12.1. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your what? This is your spiritual act of worship. Isn't that interesting? Offer your bodies as sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. We are embodied creatures. Interestingly enough, our bodies are not only the ways that we give and receive love to God and other people. That's also the ways, the vehicle that we use to sin against God and other people. Think of almost any wrong that someone can do to you and it involves their body. Physical violence. The cold shoulder. Rolling their eyes in sarcasm at something you said. Gossiping. Hurtful words. We are embodied. Our body is part of who we are. It's the vehicle through which we give and receive love. It matters. Number three. My body is not just mine. It is mine, but it's not just mine. First Corinthians six. I'm going to read a few spliced verses from this chapter. Paul's talking about the body. He says the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the what? It's meant for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Flee from sexual immorality. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your... Didn't go there, did it? <laughs> I thought that slide was up there. It says, honor God with your body. The body has a purpose, and the ultimate purpose of the body is to be united with the Lord. And our bodies are ours, but not just ours. We belong to the body of Christ. And, you know, we kind of know this even if we'd rather believe I'm just in my private world. I can make my own decisions. You don't have the right to tell me what to do. My actions still affect other people. What we do with our bodies makes a difference in the people around us, doesn't it? You've probably experienced the ripple effects of someone's decisions or what they've done with themselves. That they thought, this is just me, it's my body, it's my whatever. But it had profound effects on other people. Our body in this verse is connected to the body of Christ. It belongs to Christ. It was bought at a price. And God lives, his spirit actually lives inside of us, the church. And we live inside of our bodies. That's a pretty incredible thing to think about. Paul calls us the temple of God. This building is not sacred in the same way that our bodies are sacred. The Spirit of God does not live in this building or cathedrals. The Spirit of God lives in his church. The embodied people of God. Here's number four. Our bodies are, are male or female. 
Our bodies are male or female. Let me read a verse from Genesis 1.27, the creation story. So God created humans in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Let me ask you a question. Which one is in God's image, males or females? If you're watching online, you can answer out loud. In the room, which one, male or females? Trick question. Yeah, it was funny. In the first service, it seemed like the guys yelled out males and the women yelled out females. But in this one, yes, you guys are much more theologically astute. Um, it's not or. It's not or. Watch this really carefully. God made humanity in his own, own image, males and females, Males are made in the image of God. Females are made in the image of God. And male and female united together is an even different layer of expression of God's nature. It's sad to watch how much animosity has developed between the genders throughout history. There's a difference between men and women. You can pick a lot of different categories to describe the differences between men and women, but there is a basic difference between men and women, even despite cultural gender roles. But unfortunately, so many times those differences have been used against one another in combat, in trying to have somebody be superior or dominate over the others, where in times in history, Christian men have used the Bible as license to dominate women and put them in a subpar sub role to men, totally not the image of what Christ was intended. Or where women have tried to free themselves from a relationship that is connected with men or find a superior place or an independence that was never intended by God's created design. Where the call of scripture is not animosity against the genders or conflicts or snide jokes or trying to find superiority from one to the other. The call is to honor one another above yourselves, to show what it's like to love and care for someone who is different than you because of respect for that person. In Scripture, there are a lot of differences in kinds of people, but being created male or female is not accidental. It's not incidental to who we are. It's part of God's created design. Males and females both represent God's image, and together they represent something even more incredible about the story of Scripture, which we'll get to in just a moment. My body is a part of who I am, not the whole thing, but an essential part so essential that when Jesus came to save humanity, he became human and took on flesh. There's a big word for that. It's called the incarnation. My body is the vehicle through which I give and receive love. My body is not just mine. It belongs to God. My body is male or female. It's part of God's intention and creation. Two more. Sex is number one good. And everyone said... So I don't mean just good in the sense of good. I mean good in the sense of like God's created intention. It's good. And sometimes people who are not familiar with church or are not familiar with uh, Christianity will look at the way Christians deal with sexuality and just say, gosh, you're so backwards. You're so prudish. You're so restrictive. Why don't you just loosen up and you know, enjoy yourself and enjoy the body and enjoy other people. It's actually the opposite of that. Christians aren't restrictive on sex because it's something bad or to be avoided. We realize the good gift that God has given humanity and how powerful it is. Therefore, we treat it with a higher level of respect and honor. It's because it's good that we treat it with care. In your home... You are going to store paper clips in a different place than you would store your shotgun. There's a different level of potency. You're not going to lock up paper clips. It doesn't have that much potential for, you know, 
for doing great things or terrible things. But we recognize the sacredness of this gift that God's given us. And we also recognize that when we use God's good gifts in ways that he didn't intend, it brings great deals of harm. In my backyard, I like to make fires. In fact, even this winter, I'll just find excuses to burn things. I just like to go out and have a fire, sometimes sit around with other people. And our fire is, I usually build around the back toward the forest by, by the edge of our property. And if I am burning something, I want to be very careful that it doesn't get away from me because as fun as it is to make a fire, it's not fun to have your forest catch on fire. And so we always burn within our fire rings. Teach the kids to be really careful that the embers, the ashes, the, the sticks that are on fire don't get out of that. The fire ring, which is in our house, a bunch of blocks that don't catch on fire. And even when I'm backpacking or camping in the woods, if we would build a fire, we would always find some rocks and build a ring around the fire because we love the fire. It gives warmth, it gives heat, it gives light, it brings people around to a common goal, but we love the fire in its place. When the fire gets out of its boundary, when it gets out of the ring, if it starts catching a pile of dry leaves or a tree, we have a big problem. The fire is good, but it must stay within the boundary of its intention. God has given us a boundary for sexual expression, and it is the ring of marriage between a man and a woman. If it gets out of that context, it's not that it doesn't do some of the same things. It does, but it is in a place to do great damage to people that God loves. In the words of the contemporary philosopher Beyonce, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Anybody know how to do that dance? Taking volunteers after this for, for the third service. Sex is a good gift, and it has a boundary of marriage that God intended. Here's the last one. It's a sign. It's a sign of something more than just what it is. It represents something beyond itself. In marriage, it represents a faithful, committed love, a covenant love, a bond, kind of that circle and ring or, or boundary of trust. If you would go to work tomorrow, order a pizza, and share some of the pizza with your coworkers, if you happen to be married, that's not going to cause a rift in your marriage. If you happen to be driving home today and you're married and you see a homeless person of the opposite sex on the road and you give them your coat and then you drive home, it's probably not going to create a, a marital crisis. But if you share your body intimately with someone, it breaks all kinds of levels of relationship because it's not just the act of what it is. It's a sign. It represents the faithful commitment that you have in that relationship. And it represents something even higher. When Paul writes about this in Ephesians, at the end of his letter in Ephesians, he talks about the commitment that we have in relationship representing the commitment of Jesus to his church. That our faithfulness in the way that we use our bodies, the boundary of marriage, actually shows a sign to the world of the faithfulness of Jesus. Now, this sometimes is a stretch, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense connecting in the world. For example, have you ever had a conversation with somebody who, when they were born, their, their parents were never married, and then dad took off, and they grew up their whole life without a relationship with dad? And inside of this girl's heart growing up, she's wondering, why did my dad take off? Wasn't I wanted? Didn't he care? Am I not valuable? And then later as she gets older, she goes to church and she hears somebody tell her that, God, your heavenly father loves you. He's committed to you. He'll never leave you. And she's going, I don't, I don't know if I buy that crap. Because I've never experienced that. 
Um, listen, we all fail in many ways. In all kinds of categories. We're not the representation of Christ in a perfect sense. Even the best of families fall short in many ways. But when we live faithful to God's intentions, it sort of sparks something in the soul that reminds us that Jesus is faithful to his church and that God is the example of committed love. And we get to live that out in our day-to-day -day relationships. I'll read you a quote from Tim Tennant in a book called For the Body. He said, for Christians, marriage is a covenantal union of two genders brought into a one flesh relationship. Two different glories coming together to make one new glorious unity. It points us to another spiritual reality, that of Christ in the church. In the gospel, we see the revelation of two glories coming together to unite Christ, who is the cosmic gr bridegroom, to the bride of Christ in the, new, in the new creation. Because they point to something else, men and women are not interchangeable generic biological units. Children need a father and a mother, each with their own gifts, graces, and glories. This is also why fornication and adultery are prohibited for Christians, because sexual activity is a sign of or marker of God's covenantal love. And Christians must not engage in any sexual activity apart from the covenantal boundaries that protect that love. Today we talked about some basic biblical ideas about our body, that it's the way that we give and receive love, that it's part of who we are, that it's also the way that we sin against God and other people, that it's not just our own, and that it's made in God's image, male and female. That sex is good, it's a gift from God, it's a sign of God's covenantal love, and it has a boundary of protection for our good. Next week, we'll build on this and talk about a lot of difficult questions that result from this. Today was just sort of the, <clears throat> here's the vision that God has for us, but what do we do about it? Next week, we'll talk about all kinds of questions like, if I'm same-sex attracted and trying to follow Jesus, how do I live that out? Or if I have a, a child or grandchild who is engaged to someone of the same sex, should I go to the wedding? How, how should I respond to that relationship? Maybe I work with somebody who's in a gender transition. How should I interact with that person or what should I call them? If I have a history where maybe I'm living with somebody that I'm not married to, but we're trying to move toward a godly direction, what should we do now? Or maybe I'm divorced or single or widowed, and how does this subject apply to me in my life? Maybe I'm um, in a situation where I've been abused growing up in this area, and it's really affected the way I go into my marriage, or my marriage is cold in that category, and we're not sure how to move forward with that, or maybe I have a secret pornography addiction that's really affecting my relationship. So we'll talk about all those things. Real easy questions. We'll just kind of breeze through that stuff next week. It'll be a piece of cake. We'll get out early. But I'd encourage you, um, if, you're, if you're watching or if you're participating, um, invite a friend, invite a, a plus one person, share the link to a message that you think somebody might like to wrestle through. Um, looking at God's word in terms of this very important topic because it's in conversation everywhere. We want to look at God's guidance on the topic. Can we stand together as we close? If you're a guest with us or if you want to communicate something, um, communication card's a great way to do it. Just drop it in the box. If you are newer to Pathway, um, just let me say again, we're so excited you're here. We love getting to know names. We love wherever you are on the spiritual journey, just connecting with each other and helping us grow. Let me say this again. We all fail in many ways. Our goal is to have grace, incredible grace on one another in your failings. I need it and expect it from you as much as I hope it for you. And we all want to help one another grow every day to be more and more like Jesus. Please, before you leave the room, try to find a face that you don't know very well. Say hi to him. Get to know somebody that you haven't met yet. And as you go this week, you hit Monday tomorrow.
Know that God is with you. He is going to show up every morning this week. He's got something for you in each day this week. Let's not go through the motions and just get through another week to the weekend. Make a difference in somebody's life. Say something that will change their perspective. Share love in a way that will surprise them. You are sent.